On this episode of Marketing Mavericks, we talked to Shiv Singh, who is the Senior Vice President of Global Digital Brand and Marketing for Visa. We talk about their transformation and how they use social media to engage customers. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth from Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Marketing Mavericks is brought to you by Squarespace.com. Creating and editing your website is easier than ever with Squarespace 7. It's so easy that Jeff Bridges created his website, dreamingwithjeff.com. Try it now. Visit squarespace.com and enter offer code MM at checkout to get 10% off. And by LegalZoom. Visit LegalZoom.com to save on your legal needs and gain access to a network of legal plan attorneys for guidance. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and use offer code MM to receive $10 off at checkout. And by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great tasting snacks right to your door. Start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like roasted Peruvian corn kernels. To get your complimentary NatureBox sampler, visit naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. This is Marketing Mavericks, episode 41, recorded Thursday, February 5th, 2015. Shiv Singh and Visa. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, where we talk about everything at the intersection of marketing and technology. And today we've got a guest from Visa. We're going to talk all about how Visa engages with customers. He's also written a book on social media, social media for dummies, actually. So it may not be for you, or maybe it is. Um, we're going to talk about that and much more. Before we get to that, I want to welcome uh, Anthony, our technical director. Hello, Hello. Anthony. I'm good. How are you? So Sven is with you today. Yeah. Um, I, don't hey, know, Sven. I don't think I have a camera on him. No. There was a. I noticed there was a picture of him on Inside Twit. He's a new technical yeah. director. What? <laughs> yeah. Um, he's. Uh, we're working. We're trying to find a show for him, but uh, I'm sure we'll work something out. I love Sven. If I were to have a dog, it would be Sven. Yeah. Perfect dog. This anyway. Happy to have Sven join us. And our guest today is Shiv Singh, who is the. Senior Vice President of Global Brand and Marketing Transformation at Visa Inc. What a mouthful. Welcome, Shiv. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Are you a dog owner? Do you have dogs? No. Kittens, cats, turtles, goldfish? I have little kids. Sometimes <laughs> they act like all of the above. I'm pet free They as act well. like more like dogs often. But your kids? How old are your kids? Five and three. They, they just can't stop running. That's the thing with them. They have so much energy. It's, it's, I, I don't know how they do it. They wake up in the morning and it's like they shoot off the bed. <laughs> they shoot off. Well, that sounds exciting. Hmm, I wonder what it's yeah. like at your house. Um, and you, you know, I'm super excited to have you on the show. I've actually wanted to interview for some time. You've got a strong background, not just working for a, such a notable brand, Visa. You've worked for PepsiCo. Um, you worked for probably if it, one of certainly the most um, famous digital marketing agencies, Razorfish. Um, uh, was you were in fact you were at Razorfish for a very long time. Um, in fact, you were at Razorfish for what over a decade, I think. Um, that's a long tenure at any agency, especially in an, at a time where the everything's changing so much. I mean, you you were with Razorfish really at the beginning of kind of the social media boom, uh, awakening to, to how brands were evolving and using digital marketing. Um, why, why did you, how did that relationship start? Like, why did you end up going with, to Razorfish? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I spent, uh, I think it was 12 or 14 years at Razorfish and it started, I joined them, uh, you know, back in 1998. And, you know, I was, I was one of those guys who, you know, well, going a little further back in 1994 and 1995 was, probably one of the five people on the internet and and i was saying oh you know this thing is going to be big and you know i was building websites um i was i was having a lot of fun and 
around 1998, you know, I, I just finished school and uh, Razorfish was the number one digital agency. And, and I was very lucky to get an opportunity to join them. And, uh, and then I just stayed with them through, you know, the, the dot-com boom and bust and the reboom. Um, and through that time, I had an opportunity to work in their um, Boston, New York, San Francisco and, and London offices and, and got some wonderful experiences working with clients like Mercedes-Benz and Ford Motor Company and Philip Morris and uh, Genentech. So it was a great experience. And, you know, I'd wake up every morning realizing I had something more to learn and something more to contribute. And that's what kept me there for that long. That, you know, a lot of people do leave. And you mentioned you have, you worked with a lot of exciting brands. Um, so what was, why did you decide to finally leave after uh, giving so much of your career to Razorfish? Yeah. You know, good question. I, I really enjoyed my time at Razorfish. And, you know, I worked with incredibly small people and, and, and learned an incredible amount. And, and I have a, a lot of fondness for Razorfish. Some of my oldest friends are still at Razorfish. Um, but this, you know, PepsiCo opportunity presented itself, which was really unique and special in its way. And that was to, to run digital for PepsiCo beverages. And, you know, they have a suite of brands, starting with brand Pepsi. And it, I felt it would give me a chance and an opportunity to learn a lot more about marketing, to see, you know, what happens further upstream before the creative process or before a consumer sees... Um, sees a piece of communication or interaction or engagement. Um, and, you know, what better place to learn than, than at PepsiCo, which, which is such a storied and wonderful uh, brand and marketer and, uh, and company as a whole. Uh, so it was, it was a hard opportunity, uh, you know, to say no to because it was so special. And yet at the same time, it was hard to leave the agency side where, you know, the agency side is really special because, you get to do a lot of work yourself. You get to do a lot of thinking. Whereas when you move over to the brand, you end up having to do a lot of managing and a lot of budgets and a lot of sort of grown up stuff. Um, so, so it's hard to leave the agency side, but the lure of the Pepsi brand and the opportunity to grow and learn in different ways and broaden my skill set was hard to refuse as well. Well, you were at Pepsi during a time where um, they had some really successful campaigns. I know you've talked about, and, and in fact, one of the things about Pepsi is they they align themselves with a lot of celebrities and stars, and um, they do a lot of uh, you know innovative um, marketing around that. Katy Perry, I know, was uh, a big uh, pr promoter. What was probably your biggest memory or one of your biggest success stories while you were at Pepsi? Well, you know, one thing you quickly learn uh, when you're on the brand side is that it truly takes an army to, to, to do great work. You know, it's your agents, partners, it's your peers internally, it's your own team. Um, so, so I'd firstly say the successes were, were big team successes. But I, I had a lot of fun uh, doing a few things. So, so we executed three major Super Bowl programs and were, you know, top of the social media buzz charts uh, for each of them. Um, we deployed uh, a huge marketing campaign around uh, the X Factor and did that for two years. And that was the time when I first learned to think about digital and the physical world together and how to you know, think of, of every single Pepsi can as a form of media uh, itself. Um, uh, another thing we did, which was a lot of fun, was developing and launching Pepsi Pulse, which was a global media network, basically a global publishing platform for pop culture stories. Uh, and tying into that also was uh, uh, launching the Pepsi Experience Point social loyalty program, which was one of the first of its kind where, you know, rather than just rewarding people for um, transactions, we started to reward people for their loyalty to, loyalty to the brand and the social actions that they were taking. Um, so there, there were a lot of different things. And I mean, it, Pepsi was crazy. Every day I'd learn something new. And each day, just because of that business and the intensity of it, every day would have an incredible high and then also a deep low because there'd be so much stress and pressure too. At Pepsi, you were one of the first brands to really capitalize on using Instagram 
um, as a way to reach customers. And you certainly understand, you understood the demographic and where um, your users and, and consumers were as far as platforms go. When you talk about Facebook and Google and the ghost town of Google Plus and but you you capitalized on Instagram, which which not a lot of brands even today have figured out how to do. Um, what was the what was the strategy behind h- how to connect and 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 did your users uh, did consumers of, of Pepsi products really want to engage with you on Instagram? Yeah, yeah, we saw that a lot with the Mountain Dew brand actually because they had a really fierce, strong, loyal uh, following, um, and uh, and and they were sort of ripe for for the Instagram audience. Uh, I'd say you know the key learning working at Pepsi is that. Uh, Within the, the Pepsi beverages portfolio, there were several different brands and they played different roles in the media ecosystem. And, and they have very different types of consumers. And in some cases, one brand would work really well for a social platform and another would fall flat. So with Instagram, more than any other brand, it was Mountain Dew that was so, so rich and so powerful in its engagement. And that's because you had a lot of Mountain Dew users already on Instagram, Mountain Dew wasn't an ad or, a, or, or something external to their lives. It was very much part of who they were and who they are and part of their identity. So they were already doing things with the product and photographing it on Instagram. And it was natural for the Mountain Dew brand and you know, credit to the brand team as well to, to sort of insert itself. But that doesn't apply to every brand everywhere. And that's where so much of social media is still as much an art as it is a science. What was your biggest takeaway from working at Pepsi and engaging a very youthful customer um, who consumed your products, whether it was Mountain Dew or one of your other brands? Yeah, you know, there were a lot of different takeaways, but I would say probably the biggest thing that I learned is that no more can brands sit apart and separate to culture. Um, for, for brands to resonate with consumers, they have to increasingly become a part of their consumers' lives. They have to add value to it. They have to look at the world through the lens of um, what role does the brand play in a consumer cultural context versus being a de- uh, uh, an interruption or a disruption or a, something apart from it. And understanding how a brand can play in culture, how it can get permission, how it can sort of penetrate culture, uh, whether that's in digital or, or in other media or other forms, I'd say was my biggest learning because it's, you know, it's, it's easy to create marketing and put marketing out there. It's very hard to create marketing that people actually care about. You're, you know, you're now at Visa, obviously. Um, and um, I think as far as a brand is obviously globally very recognizable. Um, and there's, so I guess my question for you is, why did you decide to, to, to join Visa and, and leave kind of a sexy brand like Pepsi and, and some of the fun things that you do? What was so enticing about Visa that you decided to come on board? Well, I thought if I moved to the West Coast, which I did for Visa, I'd have a better chance of appearing on your show since you're based out here. Of so that course. Was yeah, <laughs> no other reason, nothing else. Um, I, I mean, th- there were a lot of uh, uh, different reasons, but I'd say uh, probably among the biggest was, uh, you know, what's so special about Visa is the entire business and the entire industry is going digital. And we're seeing that with, uh, you know, Visa Checkout and Apple Pay and mobile payments. Um, And it's all about how does this brand live in a digital ecosystem and yet at the same time bring more and more people into this this digital and this financial ecosystem. Uh, You know, at at the end of the day, um, uh, the Pepsi product, at least to the best of my knowledge, will always be uh, a physical product. It's something that you drink. Uh, The idea of a company like Visa transforming because its entire industry, its entire business was going digital. For someone who grew up digital was just, you know, uh, an incredibly exciting opportunity and a growth and a learning opportunity for me. I want to talk about your points of view on wearable, privacy and security and how Visa is approaching those things. Before I do, I actually want to thank a sponsor of Marketing Mavericks. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace.com. It's 
even easier to create your own professional website or online portfolio. So easy, in fact, that Jeff Bridges created his website, dreamingwithjeff.com. You've seen him on The Dude, The Big Lebowski, and Kevin Flynn from Tron. You know, Jeff Bridges. Everybody knows who he is. Well, he uses Squarespace. Squarespace and Jeff also teamed up to create a Super Bowl ad featuring the Jeff Bridges sleeping tapes. His album of relaxing sounds and stories designed to put you to sleep. You can pick you can check it out at squarespace.com. So if you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com. And if you want to use Squarespace, if you want a great site just like Jeff, you have to check out the completely redesigned Squarespace 7. There are 14 new designs, giving you over 30 to choose from. Squarespace has designed templates for everything, including musicians, artists, architects, restaurants, weddings, e-commerce. In fact, the fact they include e-commerce is a huge deal. Uh, Making changes is also easier now with Squarespace. With live editing on one screen, no more toggling to preview the preview mode. Pick from thousands of professional Getty images and use them on your site for just $10 each. Social media is built in. Link your site to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google+, Tumblr, YouTube, Pinterest, and more. Incredibly easy to use. I think that's probably my favorite feature, actually, about Squarespace is it's not only beautiful, and you can't, I mean, again, celebrities are using it. Um, I've had uh, about every other guest I've had who has some sort of personal business Um, has used Squarespace because why? It's easy. That's always been such a hangout for people. Squarespace is easy to use. And if you want some help for, if you still feel like you need some, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24-7. And guess what? It starts at just $8 a month and Squarespace takes care of the hosting so you don't have to. Plus, you get a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website. When you sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code MM to get 10% off. We thank Squarespace for their support of Marketing Mavericks. Squarespace, start here, go anywhere. Squarespace, we thank you so much for your support of the show. And Shiv, Visa, Exciting brand, right? You get to do a lot of things in a very controversial space. I mentioned before we went to Squarespace that um, you guys are diving into some things I wouldn't think about, maybe wearable. Um, Definitely privacy and security is an issue. And then mobile payments is the next thing. I was at the grocery store last night and uh, using mobile payments at a store I didn't expect to. I think it's going to be more and more, people are going to be more and more comfortable with it as it makes life easy. It's. I think I've heard you say it's about and I think this were your words, actually, enabling friction-free living, right? Yes. I mean, the mobile space is so, so exciting. And, and you know, in our business, it's, it's really exciting from the product standpoint, which is how do you make mobile payments happen? And then, of course, how do you market around them? Um, so, you know, to give you an example with, with Apple Pay, it, it was, you know, the Visa uh, product teams and the Visa product innovation teams that did amazing, amazing work around a technology called tokenization, which actually enables Apple Pay, you know, and that's how, you know, your card appears in Apple Pay. That's how it's incredibly secure and and easy to use. Um, But the fascinating thing is with Apple Pay, you know, here in the States, mobile payment, you know, at point of sale uh, is is still pretty uncommon. It's you, you see people rarely do it. And our challenge is, We want people to use, you know, solutions like Apple Pay more and more because it is quicker, it is uh, safer, it is uh, more fun to use, it is a better use experience for the consumer. And that's now, you know, our collective challenge with our financial institutions partners in terms of how do you market and promote Apple Pay and other solutions like it? Because it's a lot easier than taking out your wallet and paying cash or even physically swiping a card. It's, it's, it's a virtual card. I had to give somebody a check the other day for something and I had to actually find my checkbook. I had to actually go home and get it and write a check. It just seems so unnatural today to use, you know, 
currency that we took for, you know, we all, we did for everything at, at one point. Um, how, how are you guys approaching the target customer for something like, um, electronic pay, like Apple pay or, uh, pay, being able to pay with your phone? Are you targeting, um, a certain demographic? Are you going for more of the millennial? I mean, who's actually the, b- the biggest user of something like that? Yeah, you know, so it's, it's really interesting in our business, you know, what a lot of folks don't realize is our business is fundamentally about the pipes to which money transfers uh, and happens. You know, it's, it's, it's like we're this massive highway. Um, when it comes to Apple Pay, it's uh, the marketing is being led by our financial institution partners, you know, like Wells Fargo and Chase and others. But we're very much there to, to help them. In terms of who we target or they target or us jointly, um, it really depends on who their existing customer base is and how many iPhone users sit within that. And I'd say that's the biggest driver uh, of, of how we focus on marketing and the kind of adoption it's getting. Um, but what's fair to say is Apple pays in such early days, whether it's us or our financial institution partners, there's so much to do in terms of marketing and promoting. And it's, it's such amazing, awesome technology. Uh, we're all very excited about it. What about privacy and security? I mean, is this a secure way for consumers to now uh, pay for products? I mean, people are afraid of that. How are you overcoming that type of objection, if you will, uh, for consumers who are um, afraid of, you know, I, I remember a time when people were afraid to use LinkedIn because they thought it was spam. And we have to get, you know, consumers past this kind of fear factor of something new. How do you, how are you guys approaching that? Yeah, you know, one of the, I mean, there are a lot of very exciting things about working at Visa. Um, one of them is is the fact that this is a brand, you know, it's according to Miller Brown, it's ranked as the seventh most powerful brand in the world. This is a brand that people truly and really deeply trust whether it's in the financial services space or more broadly, we make sure that, uh, you know, as money gets transferred and moved and as it happens on our network, it is more safe and secure than anywhere else. Um, and, and then our clients and financial institutions also support that immensely. So the reason why Apple Pay, why Apple us, instead of creating their own solution, and on their own, or one of the many reasons is they recognize the power of the Visa brand, the comfort level that people have with it, and, and also the, the kind of security that's provided for our technologists. You made a really good point that Visa already has such a strong uh, brand recognition. Are people loyal to, uh, in the financial business, are they loyal to a specific type of, are they loyal to MasterCard? Are they loyal to Visa? Or is it about American Express? I mean, how... How does a financial institution like Visa um, actually gain customer loyalty? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not familiar with those other two brands you mentioned. <laughs> um, but I can talk about Visa uh, specifically. So yes, firstly, I mean, there is a lot of loyalty. There's no question about it. That's why we're ranked, you know, seven, uh, according to Miller Brown. More specifically, though, and, you know, we, we're a complex ecosystem where People choose cards based on the payment brand like Visa or one of the others, but also based on, you know, what kind of rewards and services they're getting from the banks. It's a combined choice. Uh, what we do know is that our brand is stronger than our competitors and that it is a, an important factor as they uh, make that, that choice about, you know, what, what card to carry. What we also know is that our card is accepted in many more places than our competitors and that uh, consumers know that, and that's also a a big factor. The third thing we know which matters a lot is, especially in markets outside the U.S., where fewer people, uh, you know, have cards, the Visa brand is sometimes bigger than the bank's brand. And you could have a small bank issuing cards, but the reason why the consumer is comfortable signing up for, you know, what may be their first credit card, is the fact that it has the Visa brand on it as well. So, you know, there are a lot of different reasons. And as a business, we're in this complex ecosystem with our our financial institutions, the banks who are our clients and the merchants, and then there's the consumer. Um, But we we do know the Visa brand makes a difference and it does influence what card you use. 
how much varies by, you know, different parts and parts of the world. How do you guys approach or look at um, cryptocurrency, things like Bitcoin and um, that kind of movement? Is Do you take it seriously? Is that something that we're going to see more of or is it is it a fad? Is it something that's just going to die out and people are not going to really adopt to using that type of product? Yeah, you know, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. That's more for uh, our product folks and, you know, who know who know all that inside out. Um, what I can say, though, is that, you know, we, we pace with our consumers. Um, we, we don't bring things to the marketplace that they may not want or may not be interested in. Um, uh, we, we focus on being everywhere our consumers want to be and facilitating and being the best way to pay and be paid for, for everyone everywhere. Something I know that you do feel very comfortable talking about, and I think is, is an interesting type of uh, relationship, is this movement of wearables, right? So we've moved into a society of wearable tech, and I think we're going to see so much more of that in the future, especially as the fashion industry um, gets with uh, all the geeks and they produced, you know, wearable tech that more and more people want to wear. How does how are you guys approaching wearable technology, Avisa? So I think it's going to be an awesome, awesome marketing opportunity. Um, it's still really early days. Uh, but the reason why I say it's awesome is, you know, so much time is spent on mobile phones today. Um, you know, I, I read recently that, uh, you know, consumers on average pull out their mobile phones 120 or 150 times a day, of which probably only five or 10 of those are for voice calls. Now that's with mobile phones. As wearables take off and the number of uses of them, you know, multiply, and I, I saw some of that at CES, the role for brands in them is only going to increase. And they have to increase and we need it to increase because it's going to take time away from your TV screen or your desktop computer, or even your mobile phone. Um, I think mobiles give consumers amazing insights and data about their lives that they wouldn't have had. It also helps them lead a, a greater ambient existence where, you know, you may need to know about something, but you don't need to give it 100% of your time. In that context, a brand's role becomes really interesting because, you know, for example, you may be walking down the street in um, Singapore and there may be this awesome visa offer from a merchant that you're walking by. Now, normally we don't really have a way to tell you about that offer that you could take advantage of because you have a visa card. If you have a wearable device, you know, on your wrist or, I don't know, around your neck or wherever it may be, uh, that alerts you about that without distracting you if you're driving or if you're in conversation. That's hugely valuable. That's valuable to us because we're able to provide something to useful information to you. It's valuable to you because you can get this awesome offer. And yet at the same time, you're not being distracted with a big ad or a big, uh, uh, I don't know, announcement or, or telephone alert or something like that. So there are all kinds of opportunities and, and we're really at the early days of it. Do consumers really want that kind of relationship with a brand that's just going to, you know, come into their life at, at a moment that the brand sees an opportunity? Are consumers, do they want that? You know, I, I think uh, what's interesting, and, and I'm going to be a little controversial here, which is we think about brands as, as we, we come to the conversation about brands as if it's something that consumers don't want and it's forced upon them, that their lives would be a lot better and cleaner and neater without brands involved. I believe it's the opposite. Uh, you know, if, if I think about my own life or if I think about other people's lives, we all have a small set of brands, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 15, that, that play an incredibly important and personal uh, value in, uh, in our lives and always have. We badge ourselves with those brands we form our identities with those brands. We expect a lot of them and they give us a lot. And if we don't get it, we get really upset. So firstly, I believe certain brands have a lot of permission to play in consumers' lives. And, and we see that in, in different ways. You know, for me, outside of Visa, 
I'm an Apple fan. You know, I, I was one of the those Apple boys in the dark days of the mid nineties for Apple. I'll probably go and buy that Apple watch without even thinking about the specs. I'll buy it blindly. Apple has immense permission to play a much bigger role in my life. In that fashion, they, for every major powerful brand, um, they have more permission in their consumers' lives than they sometimes realize. Now, it's very much an art and a science and really hard to crack how to use that permission well versus crassly taking advantage of it. Um, and that's what makes all our jobs exciting is knowing what that fine line is, where we're doing what our consumers expect from us or what they depreciate that we do, because we're adding value to their existence or contributing to their sense of identity versus distracting and disappointing them. Um, you know, uh, uh, just to end my diatribe on this, uh, I'd say, for example, I'm sitting on a chair. Now, if my chair started sending me alerts and I don't know the brand, uh, I, I would go crazy. I'd be like, this is horribly insulting. I don't want these alerts. Who are you? But Facebook is a brand too. And if it sends me alerts, I'm totally fine with that. So it really depends. Are we trained to just be accepting now of any time a brand wants to send us a message or alert us about something? Is that just a part of our culture now? We've just, uh, we're just changing as, as human beings and how we um, accept advertising? Uh, you know, I think we're trained, and I'd say have been trained for a long time to accept that from brands like Apple and Visa. Uh, no offense to the chair manufacturer, but not from the chair. <laughs> so it really, really what? depends. The chair, you know? No, okay. Yeah, I mean, if I get alert from my chair in the next ever, I would probably go crazy. <laughs> I'll, I'll be like, I'm done. I don't know. I don't know if I want my chair to talk to me. I'll play that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about it. Or if your light awesome. talks to you, you know, it's these. The, I have like really functional relationships with my light switch in my bedroom. Really massively important. I love it to death, but I couldn't care less about it. I don't want, want to know the brand's name. I don't want it to talk to me. I just wanted to come on work when I wanted to work. I want to talk about how you, some of the campaigns that you've worked on and a little bit more uh, too about wearables. Before we do that, I want to thank another sponsor of Marketing Mavericks and that's LegalZoom. In fact, what was your top New Year's resolution? Well, if you're like me, it's getting your life organized. Something I struggle with all the time. And creative people, we sometimes tend to be less organized. We want to be organized. Well, I guess if you're wondering where to begin, and you probably are, a great place to start is protecting your family. And a great way to take control of your family's future is making a will or living trust. That's where LegalZoom can help. There's no easier way to make sure your family is legally taken care of. Getting your life organized also means taking control of your financial affairs. So if you're thinking of starting a business or you have one already, LegalZoom can help you form your business and provide you the support you need to run it successfully. For more than 10 years, LegalZoom has helped millions of people get their personalized attention they need. And if you'd like more help, they can connect you with an independent attorney in more states but they're not a law firm. In fact, I know just starting my own personal businesses, it's probably one of the biggest headaches. You're so focused on clients and the actual job that you do that getting organized is pretty tough. LegalZoom is a great way to give you peace of mind with that exactly. So don't let another year pass you by before getting your life organized. For legal help you can count on, for your family or small business, go to LegalZoom.com and enter offer code MM to receive $10 off at checkout. Protect your family and protect your future at LegalZoom.com. We thank LegalZoom for their support of marketing mavericks. And definitely, I would say if you're starting a business and a lot of you guys that follow this show are, LegalZoom will help you. Let them help you. And... Um, Big fans here at Twit, of course. And our guest, I want to get back to Shiv. Thank you so much again for joining us. Next time, like I said, we need to have you in studio. It's crazy that you're not here, right? Definitely. We'll do that for sure. <laughs> so 
you know, you um, have worked with some pretty exciting campaigns. You recently came out of the Super Bowl, uh, which was very uh, popular, popularly watched. I watched it. Um, a little bit of a Seahawks fan, but mostly just like to watch the game. And I like the the interaction that the players have. And, and I like it if it's a really close game, right? But there was a lot of advertising. In fact, you guys had a big promotion. What was your relationship with the Super Bowl this year? So we, we as Visa have a, have a, I don't know, it's a multi-year, many-year relationship where um, it's, 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 it's anchored in the NFL. So we're one of the NFL sponsors. So we do a lot of advertising through the season. We actually did a lot of on-the-ground uh, fun activations uh, at the Super Bowl before and, and during the Super Bowl. Um, and we were promoting Visa Checkout, which is this awesome, awesome product. It helps you pay online. It's one one click, much easier payment. Um, so we were activating around that and um, uh, partnering with uh, Drew Brees and others just to show how efficient and how smartly uh, you can pay with Visa Checkout. So it was a lot of fun and worked really well. The Verge had an article about if you tried to buy everything that was promoted by Visa. Um, how successful was this campaign for you? Um, I mean, it's, it's all about launching and promoting uh, Visa Checkout, and, and that's going incredibly well. I mean, you know, we're a mass market brand. It's not easy to, to reach a lot of people at once, even though, um, you know, we have 2.6 billion cards in market and, uh, you know, billions of consumers. So we look for opportunities where we can, you know, reach a lot of consumers at once. And the Super Bowl with its 114 million viewers, viewers is, is a perfect opportunity and always works for us. Um, and, and more than that, it's also the entire NFL season. You um, are, you know, I mentioned this at the top of the show. I want to talk a little bit about your book because it's been very successful. This isn't, uh, is this your third edition of Social Media Marketing for Dummies? Yes, correct. It's, it's crazy. So I wrote the first edition five years ago uh, when, when my oldest son was being born. And, and it actually worked perfectly because I'd be, you know, awake from like 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. because of feeding and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd feed him and then I'd, I'd have nothing to do. So I could write chapters. It, it worked effect, uh, really well. Uh, the, uh, the book was launched. It did well. It actually did a lot better, even better than I expected. Um, and because the industry is changing so much, I was asked to write the second edition uh, pretty quickly. I'd say it was barely a year and a half after that. And then the third edition uh, just came out in December as well. And, you know, in conversations with my uh, publisher and other authors, everyone is surprised how much change this book goes through with each edition. And, and that's really, you know, a reflection of our industry more than anything else. So how has it changed? I mean, to your point, when social media marketing for dummies was, or just social media marketing, um, and, I, and I actually don't even like the word social media, but... Um, how has it changed from your first book to to the most recent edition? Um, and what's like the biggest difference as an author that you've seen? Yeah, so there been so some things haven't changed, and then there's a lot that's changed. So in terms of what has not changed, firstly, I would say it's it's the core concepts around social media marketing. You know how social influence works online, how how brands need to evolve to be more participatory and more conversational how your, your brand tone and voice needs to be ready for the digital uh, generation, the science behind social network theory, which is all my grad research. Those fundamentals have not changed and exist very much uh, today as well. But then when you think about the platforms and when you think about mobile, there's been huge change. So to give you an example, five years ago, there was a MySpace chapter. That chapter does not exist anymore. There is no what? MySpace chapter. But it's there's wrong. still MySpace. Are you not I on know. MySpace, Shiv? What? Well, you know, I, I had to choose between MySpace and Instagram and Pinterest and uh, Tumblr and all of those others got chapters. And unfortunately, MySpace didn't. Maybe it'll come back in the next edition. I don't know. Is but... there a chapter on Ello? On... No, <laughs> not yet. But I do talk about like Ello, what? It's, it's not yet big enough for a chapter, but I do talk about it. <laughs> really? Because yeah. yeah. that's uh, so sad. 
What? Yeah. So, so that's one example. Another example is in the first edition, there was no mobile marketing chapter and its connection with social media marketing. Now it's, it's I think, probably the biggest chapter. Well, I think especially since uh, consumers, I mean, we use our mobile device as our second screen and may, many times as we talked about, about Visa Pay, but just in general to do our shopping and buying, I know I do. Um, I'm tr- currently trying to buy a sofa right now. Please go to Facebook and vote. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, I have a hard time making decisions and I definitely use, uh, oh, we all do. <laughs> I'm back. Me. Yeah, it's bad. Um, so, so in your book and, and I, I have friends, I literally had a friend call me this week and, and they're just finally getting into, um, the social space, uh, trying to understand, they knew it was important, but they, I think a lot of people, especially in business who have small businesses, struggle with really what this means. And so they just avoid it because they just don't, they don't know what to do with it. They may have a Facebook page. What is, what is a takeaway for, for somebody who maybe has a small business who, uh, obviously they should get your book, uh, but what's probably the biggest thing that they're going to get out of social media marketing for dummies? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, the biggest thing they'll get out is, is being able to separate, uh, all the hype and the buzz uh, from the reality of what can actually physically help your business. Um, and, and that at a strategic level and then executionally, very specifically about what you should do first, how you should do it, how it can be uh, probably the most effective way to market uh, on scale, but in a really targeted fashion and to, to deepen loyalty uh, with your consumers. So, so I'd say there's a lot of really good strategies, but then very specifics on what you can do tomorrow morning to, you know, engage more customers, bring them into your business, drive greater loyalty with them, um, all of that through through social media. What about, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the idea of platforms themselves. So we've talked about them and we made a joke about Ello and you definitely spoke um, about Instagram you've got Facebook. In fact, you guys partnered with Facebook uh, for the Super Bowl. Um, talk about that relationship and how you, why partnering with Facebook? What was the advantage there rather than just advertising and utilizing Facebook? Yeah, we, we have a big partnership with Facebook and, and I'll actually talk about the World Cup where we uh, partnered with them in really interesting ways. Um, uh, so, you know, Facebook has something like 900 million unique users uh, a day. I think that's uh, according to the latest uh, quarterly earnings, uh, the, the usage. So every day, 900 million people log on to Facebook. You know, that's that's seven or eight times greater than the Super Bowl audience. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to find a bigger audience in one place. As we were doing the World Cup, we were looking to partner with someone through whom we could reach a lot of people around the world in one place. The, what made the Facebook relationship really special and why we continue to be, and I'm personally very excited about Facebook, is we're able to innovate with them. So, for example, during the time of the World Cup, we were the first to test and launch this new form of ad targeting where every day Facebook would tell us that this segment of the Facebook population are England fans, and if you want to talk to them in a certain way, you can. And then when those when the English team lost and those those England team fans suddenly became Argentinian fans or German uh, team fans or uh, you know some other team fans, how they became those fans and then how we could reach them and talk to them when they became Argentinian fans. So it's it's really like scientific targeting that allows you to do amazing targeting with creative messaging around it and to start conversations with them based on who they're loyal to at that point in, 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 in the World Cup. So crazy, amazing stuff that makes marketing more effective, more makes it resonate more, makes people care about it and not mind it because it's personal to them. That's an example of what we were able to do with Facebook and why having a partnership like that is so valuable. You being being a global brand um, definitely have to think about things different than maybe somebody who's more focused on uh, the United States. And I know when I had uh, Patrick Byrne on to talk about Overstock and they were launching 
in other markets uh, globally, how consumers buy is different, how they use technology is different. Um, and in some countries, they, you know, we talk about this a lot on Twitter in general, is that their mobile device is their only computer. So they use it for everything. Um, how does that, how are you guys approaching your strategy for global versus um, maybe more, you know, how we use technology here in the United States? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's where it's so important to have marketers around in your major markets, you know, who know their local consumers, know how they interact with technology, uh, know how to craft marketing programs that really, you know, work effectively for them. Uh, so it's always a, a global, local combination sort of piece of magic. Um, and I actually talk about that in, the, in my book as well, that, you know, if, if you're in this market or in this country, these are the things to consider when it, when it comes to engaging consumers. So it, it really depends. There's sort of no easy answer to it, but it does take a lot of effort. Um, and the worst thing anyone can do is to just assume that a consumer is the same everywhere in the world. You know, I want to talk about um, some of the campaigns that you've had as, and, and the success that they've brought, uh, including, uh, you know, this idea of engaging and bringing fans into the experience, which you guys have done. Before we do that, I want to thank another sponsor of Marketing Mavericks, which is Nature Box. This episode is brought to you by Nature Box. Right now, Nature Box is giving you a chance to get a complimentary trial box of their most popular snacks. And just pay $2 for shipping. It's, there, it's, we love Nature Box here at Twit. In fact, life is hectic and it's hard to make the best snack choices. When you're looking for a quick pick me up, what do I do? Get delicious, healthy snacks at naturebox.com. Nature Box has hundreds of delicious, nutritionist approved snacks. They've got zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams of trans fats, and no high fructose corn syrup. You'll even find snacks with the bold flavors you crave. So in the afternoon, when you're hungry, do what I do. Grab chocolate banana chips or Kung Pao pretzels or lemon pucker pistachios. It's easy for me to say. You know you're going to snack. So get smart about it with Nature Box. I love our Nature Box snacks. We all do. In fact, we can't keep our cabinets full of them because we eat them all the time. So start your trial today and get a complimentary sampler box at naturebox.com slash twit. Stay full, stay strong, start snacking smarter. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. And we thank Nature Box for their support of Marketing Mavericks. In fact, they've got some... Like whether you like savory or salty, whatever mood you're in, um, if you're going to snack, and we all do, in fact, it's probably better that you eat multiple times during the day instead of just really big meals. Nature Box is going to take care of you. I love Nature Box. In fact, are you a snacker, um, Shiv? Do you snack? I try not to. <laughs> it's better for you. I love snacking. Yeah, right. maybe I will. I'm going to check on Nature Box. <laughs> it's really good. It's good for you. That's the point. You've got kids. You want them to snack healthy, right? That's true. They do a lot of snacking. I want to I want to say and I do uh, follow you on Facebook and you know on a personal level you are a pretty active career person as a as a leader in marketing as a head of marketing um at some at some pretty big brands whether it's been on the agency side we mentioned Razorfish uh, PepsiCo Visa you have to balance that life right you have to balance your your very busy professional life I mean you're at an agency today we're not going to say who no spoiler alerts uh but you but you're busy you're constantly on the go um, how do you do that uh, as a very busy professional um, and be a dad and, and be active in your family? It's, it's really hard and there's no easy answer to it. Um, and, and I think, you know, the older I get, the better I get at it. And it's, it's all about boundaries and, and drawing lines. And then when you're in the workplace, being as efficient as you can, because, you know, the, the hard truth is that every hour you spend in the workplace is one hour less you can spend, uh, you know, with, with, with your family. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a continuous work in progress. And you have hobbies. In fact, you started up a, uh, a publication, an online digital magazine about wine, which is so fitting for this area. Uh, tell us about that. Since you have so much free time to, like, start a new project. 
Uh, you found it. It's uh, the Sommelier India wine. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I actually started that 10 years ago and, and uh, I started it in um, partnership with my mother, actually. So this was well before I had kids when I had more time on my hands. Um, it's both, as you can see, an online uh, e-magazine, but it's also an 80-page print magazine, a bi-monthly. And, you know, I, I love wine. I'm passionate about wine, and it's for Indians around the world to enjoy wine. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun because I, I get to test and do things that you don't necessarily get to do in a large organization. Um, I get to drink wine. I, I get to travel to wine country a lot. Uh, yes, it does give me sleepless nights occasionally, or I you know, have to work really late at night when the kids are asleep uh, on it. But it's it's a lot of fun too. It's it's a passion. You know, I definitely do. You have a so do you have recommended wines on the site? I need to find out. Yes, yes. There's a wine submission totally. Leo yeah. is a big Leo and Lisa are big uh, wine connoisseurs, so I'll have to. Show them your site. You know, yeah. You know, just to mention the it's it's hard for me to the one downside about this is it's hard for me to recommend a specific wine myself. So we have a tasting panel and and you know they do ratings and all of that good stuff. But it's very hard for me to recommend because it I always feel like I'm too child when I do so. So I'm glad you didn't ask me. You know what I would recommend. Good. If there is one, um, you know, I like to ask, ask this to especially heads of marketing who um, we see our peers, right? We see people who are doing a great job or they're doing something really interesting. And sometimes we, we want to implement those same tactics at our brand. What CMO or head of marketing out there uh, is, is really impressing you and doing a good job? Maybe you'd like to have lunch with that person. Yeah, yeah. I'd say... Well, I don't know all the names, but I'd say there are two people and two brands on two very different ends of the spectrum that are impressing me. So the first is the Dollar Shave Club. I mean, I'm blown away and I totally love how smartly they're doing their marketing. It's, it's deeply engaging. It's anchored in digital. It's, it's driving to purchase really well. It's human. It's fun. It's light. It's in the language of digital um, and it's, it's working immensely well from, for them. They're, they're able to do a lot with small budgets. And it's both, you know, that whole art and science thing I talked about, deeply emotional, but they do like all kinds of crazy targeting to know who exactly to try and reach with, with their marketing. So the first one is the Dollar Shave Club. And they're, they're showing really how you can do social media marketing on scale to build a brand that no one knew about, you know, I don't know, barely a year or two years ago. The second brand I talk about is actually McDonald's. I've been so pleasantly surprised with um, their marketing since Deb came on board. So, you know, most recently at the Super Bowl, their, their advertising was really strong. Um, I loved how it was all about I'm loving it and the tie to, you know, their, their retail outlets where it was a grassroots program as well, where, you know, they were asking consumers to pay by, you know, calling their mom or a hug or something. There's, there's something really adorable about it. And, and McDonald's, because of its history, has permission to play like that. Uh, the other piece of advertising they did, which I also found to be really strong, was their signs advertising, showing how, you know, outside of McDonald's, you have the, the, the sign and they put a message on it, how the message is anchored in culture and, and sort of reinforcing the fact that McDonald's has a deep history in, in American culture and also global culture. And, and then it had all kinds of digital manifestations too. Um, so I'll say these, these are two brands that are doing, I feel, really interesting things. Dollar Shave Club on one end in, in a very grassroots, small business fashion that's scaling up really quickly. And for the small businesses out there, I would encourage you to really study them. And then on the other side, uh, uh, you know, uh, McDonald's and everything it has done lately too. I think I need to have somebody on for McDonald's. I've had on the CMO of Taco Bell and Arby's. It's time for McDonald's. That's a brand that's definitely had a lot of challenges throughout the years. They've, uh, yeah. they've, they've really had to be very nimble, very flexible, and uh, and try to work with consumers 
listen to them and, and create new products that are going to make them happy. And they've, they've been very successful at it. I actually had Michael Dubin on, who's the CEO of Dollar Shave Club, back when that very first video went viral. Mm. And uh, everybody was loving it, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Two completely Big different brand. brands you mentioned. I think it's very interesting that one is a very small brand and one is definitely one of the largest brands uh, out there. So, interesting that you picked those two. So as a leader in marketing and with employees and, and, you know, things that we do, we always look back and say, I would have done this differently. What's something that maybe you've done over like the last year that you would potentially do differently um, if you had the ability to go back in time, if you had a time machine? Well, Tanya, you know, if we were having this conversation over a glass of wine, <laughs> or speaking of wine, forward, you know, <laughs> And I'd be happy to share that. And there, there are probably a few different things I could talk about. Um, but because we aren't, and it's a, it's a podcast. You're like, I'm not going to say internet. that. Oh, come on, I'm no one's good. listening, right? No, no. And, and it isn't because there aren't, you know, mistakes made. Mm -hmm. There definitely are. I don't want to imply that there aren't. Um, it's, uh, I, you know, I can't talk about work, whether it's mine or a team effort. Um, because there's also a lot of awesome stuff. What kind of qualities do you Total look for? Total cop-out, I know. No, no, that's all right. You know, it's a tough question. I think we all look back, and you're probably thinking of things right now. And I think those are those are times where we're like, you know, I would have done this a little different. Um, but but that's how we continue to get better, right, at everything that we do. So speaking of um, things that we look for, whether it's in ourselves or maybe future hires, what do you look for in candidates that you want to bring onto the Visa team what what kind of qualities uh, do you look for uh, for people who might want to join your team, who might want to work for you, Chef? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I look for people who are firstly hardworking because I think there's nothing that replaces hard work and commitment. Um, I, I look for people who have uh, strong communication skills because your, your communication skills can, uh, you know, never be strong enough in, 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 in many ways especially the more senior you get in an organization. Um, I, I look for people who are both left brain and right brain who can grow and morph into different roles because, you know, in, in our industry, uh, especially whether it's digital or the financial services or marketing more broadly, so much is changing all the time that you may hire someone for a job today, but six months or two years from now, you may need to ask them to take on something that, that could be quite different. Uh, so, so I look for people who are versatile thinkers, who are really curious, who who actually enjoy debate and enjoy collaborating and and working with others, um, and uh, and I look for you know good people, you know. And you, you, you want to be with people who who think the world can be a better place and want to make it a better place. Oh, I like that. Well, I definitely that is a great note to end on. Now, I, I will say, I. I love following your work. I, you've been uh, impressing me for quite some time, all the way back to Razorfish and when you're at PepsiCo and uh, and now at Visa doing some really interesting things in the space of the financial and wearables and which, uh, you know, I'm excited to see what you've got coming up soon. Are you going to be at South by Southwest this year? Yes, I will be. Are you speaking again? Uh, I haven't decided as yet. Hmm. Probably. Probably. All right. Well, I hope that people will consider. I would highly recommend people checking out your book. And I want to thank you. I'm going to take you up on that glass of wine, by the way, and that conversation. I'm going to ask you some tough questions. Sure. <laughs> thank you for having me. It was Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming on the show. If somebody wants to follow you, maybe check out your book uh, and get in touch with you. What, what's the best way they can do that, Shiv? Uh, well, here's the secret, which I will uh, share. The, the most efficient way to reach me is actually through Twitter. I get far too many work emails to stay on top of in a given day. Um, but on, on Twitter and the DM, I actually am able to respond quicker. And you do. So my handle is Shiv Singh, yeah. I can testify that he will respond. You're very social. You're, you're a great example of a leader in business who's very active on social media. Got to give you that for sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And we'll be in touch for that glass of wine. Sounds great. Thank you, Tonya. Absolutely. That was Shiv Singh, who is the head of uh, marketing. Actually, he's the senior vice president of global brand and marketing transformation 
at Visa Inc. What a mouthful. You can follow him. I definitely recommend that you check out his book. And we're going to have a link to that on our, our site. You can follow me as well. You can follow me at, at Tanya Hall Radio on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. And, and also you should check out our Facebook page Inside Twit. We've got a lot of fun happenings. If you want to know what happens behind the scenes with hosts and everybody else that's here, well, you can see some of that behind the scenes action at Inside Twit. And if you've got some questions about the show, maybe a recommendation, maybe you'd like to. I love reading your emails. Thank you so much. You can email me at mavericks at twit.tv. I love hearing your feedback. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And until next week, be good. 